St. Swithin's Day off, too, yeah, and all that? We don't get one. St. Aiden's? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just about going to get one. Yeah.
Well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our briefer today, who is probably known by most of you. Ambassador Eric Edelman is the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Uh, he's here to talk to you about uh, some of the uh, uh, policy efforts that have been going into the detailed discussions with our allies in Europe and uh, with respect to uh, missile defense. And he's just recently returned from the region and has offered to um, share his thoughts and the, the uh, direction in which the department is moving. So with that, sir, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good afternoon. Nice to see all of you. Uh, as I think uh, m most of you know, uh, I was in Europe last week uh, to continue a series of consultations that have actually been ongoing for uh, some number of months about uh, our plans to potentially field uh, U.S. missile defenses um, in Europe in a third site uh, with interceptors perhaps based in Poland and a uh, expand radar uh, in the Czech Republic. This would be in addition, of course, to the two sites that we currently have at Fort Greeley in Alaska and at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Um, I uh, went to uh, Europe actually in uh, fall along with General Obering uh, of the Missile Defense Agency to do a briefing for the um, North Atlantic Council uh, and then the NATO-Russia Council uh, back in, in mid-November. Uh, we've had subsequent efforts uh, to brief the Council. General Obering was there. Uh, a few weeks ago. I, I met informally with the uh, North Atlantic Council perm reps uh, three weeks ago uh, en route to my trip to uh, Afghanistan. Um, but I've also met uh, periodically with uh, officials in the other European capitals, particularly London and Paris, before last week going on to um, uh, Berlin and, and Prague uh, to meet with officials there. The um, these discussions, I think, are part of a broader uh, set of consultations that uh, we have held. Uh, in addition to my efforts, Assistant Secretary of State Dan Fried uh, was in Poland uh, two weeks ago. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary of State John Rood, uh, now nominated as, to be Undersecretary, uh, will be carrying on some of the discussions that, um, that uh, his predecessor, Ambassador Joseph, uh, had with uh, with other uh, colleagues and, and allies, uh, including our Russian uh, friends. So this is part of a, a broader and ongoing effort. As you may know, there will be a meeting of the North Atlantic Council and the NATO-Russia Council on April 18th. Uh, and last week, <clears throat> following the uh, President's phone call with um, uh, President Putin, um, one of the things that uh, we've agreed to discuss is in some detail uh, the potential for cooperation uh, with Russia. We are doing this because uh, we face a growing danger uh, of the proliferation of ballistic missile technology. Uh, there are some 20 countries developing programs uh, actively. Um, and uh, we're particularly concerned, of course, about the threats from 
uh, North Korea. We saw last summer the potential that threat represents when we had the um, the um, six or seven missile shot uh, test last summer. Um, we are also, of course, increasingly concerned about the um, missile capability that Iran is developing. Um, the effort here uh, is an effort to help extend potentially what we believe is the capability that we are developing uh, against the long-range missile threat uh, to Europe. Uh, this is not a capability we need uh, to defend the United States. The capability, the program of record that we're embarked on, once it's completed, we believe will provide um, coverage for the United States. This does, however, provide us with a capability, if we have a third site in Europe, to extend protection to our, uh, our fielded forces and those European countries that would be covered by this, um, and, and uh, to defend our friends and allies as well. And that's in keeping with some of the preliminary decisions the President made when he first came into office to change the program of record he inherited, and both to spiral out capability as it developed in the first instance, and secondly, to not only just have a national missile defense, but one that would protect uh, allies as, as well. Um, the plan which we have been discussing, which would include 10 interceptors, is, is completely defensive in nature. It doesn't pose a threat, we believe, to Russia's nuclear deterrent, uh, because we don't think that 10 uh, kinetic interceptors with no explosive warhead, much less nuclear warhead, um, would pose a threat to Russia's hundreds of, of, um, of missiles and thousands of, of warheads. We've gone to great lengths to discuss this and consult with Russia. As I said, I've been involved in briefings myself. We've had others who've been involved. Former Secretary, Under Secretary Cambone was involved in briefing our, our Russian colleagues. And moreover, as the President said in his phone conversation with President Putin, we're prepared to work together with Russia in the area to address what we believe is a threat that affects both uh, the United States and, and Russia. We'll be consulting closely as we move forward uh, with our allies in Poland and the, in the Czech Republic in these discussions to consult with the rest of the allies. Uh, we'll be obviously talking to the Congress. Um, we've had some testimony last week uh, before the Congress by uh, by General Obering and my colleague Brian Green, so that we can build a common understanding of the contribution that we believe defenses will make uh, to ensuring that our alliance has the capabilities need, needed to address the threats of the 21st century. And, and that, I believe, is in keeping with um, many, many years of efforts on the part of policymakers and administrations of both parties to ensure that the defense of the United States uh, remains coupled with the defense of Europe. And though, although obviously the threats and the challenges we face today are different than those that we faced in the Cold War, the principle of keeping U.S. and European defense coupled, I think, remains an important uh, principle that we would like to, to maintain. Um, and that's uh, what I told our, our friends and colleagues in Europe, and uh, that's, I think, what we'll be continuing to uh, discuss with them in the days, weeks, and, and months ahead. Why don't I stop there, and I'll be happy to try and, and answer any questions. Ambassador Edelman, why do you need to divide the radar and the interceptors between two different countries in Europe? What is the reasoning behind that? Um, the, uh, the disposition, the locations, um, were the, uh, determined on the basis of a lot of work that our colleagues in MDA did on on what the potentially optimal locations might be uh, to provide radar coverage, but also uh, to deal with the geometry of um, uh, and the physics of intercepting um, missiles as they overfly um, to the United States from Iran through Russian airspace and then through Central Europe. So that was really, uh, by and large, determined uh, not uh, purely on the basis of uh, geometry and, and physics, but very largely on the basis of geometry and physics, um, what the best locations would be. Yes, so can you talk a little bit more about what cooperation with Russia would look like? I mean, clearly Russia is not enthusiastic about the U.S. plan, and it appears that U.S. officials have been unable to calm any of their concerns about this. So what would cooperation look like? Are we talking about a common missile defense system? Um, well. First of all, I think we need to explore that further. We've had a number of discussions going back several years, including discussions that Secretary Rumsfeld had with his counterpart, his then counterpart, uh, Minister Sergei Ivanov, 
um, that have talked about a variety of different ways in which we might cooperate. Um, uh, one way I think that we all believe uh, would be um, something that makes sense is to look at uh, how um, sensor, sensor and early warning technology might um, be used so that um, we can have a common operational picture and that the data that we get from these radars and, and from other sensors can be uh, shared with with uh, Russia. That's that's one way. There may be some others. We're we're looking at uh, you know going back over the list of things that we have offered in the past, but looking to see right now uh, as we anticipate uh, the meeting on April 19th and then future meetings because I think we'll probably end up having a series of encounters and discussions at various levels and with various uh, departments represented, including our colleagues in the Department of State as well as those of us in the Department of Defense. What exactly further might be. Uh, be put on the table, but we're prepared to discuss um, a lot of a, a lot of potential options. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, do you see the only way ahead as a joint venture between the U.S. and Russia con um, in that putting anything um, in the other two countries really depends on getting some sort of agreement to do a joint venture with them? No, I, I don't. Don't think so. I mean, we want to cooperate with Russia. We think there's a benefit to cooperating with Russia. We think the threat is one that they face as well as uh, one that we face. In fact, they come within range of these missiles before we do. Uh, but that being said, uh, I, I don't think if for some reason we're unable to reach uh, uh, a common, commonly agreed way ahead that we would want to exceed to uh, Russia being able to dictate what we do bilaterally with other countries or what NATO does as an alliance. So uh, I'm, I'm still very hopeful that we will be able to reach uh, some understandings with Russia that will allay their concerns, uh, particularly about the uh, technical parameters of the system we're talking about. Um, Russia already has the right, uh, has had for many years under the ABM Treaty and then the subsequent um, uh, protocols that were agreed to have uh, uh, 100 interceptors uh, around Moscow. I think they've got about, I think, 85 or 86 nuclear-tipped interceptors deployed. Uh, don't see how that's been a threat to the stability of Europe over the last 35 years. Um, the, the fact that uh, we're going to have potentially 10, as I mentioned earlier, non-nuclear, non-explosive kinetic vehicles uh, in Poland, I don't think that's a threat to Russia. It, it, it is a, a, a surface-to-air system. It is not a surface-to-ground system. Um, and I think we can go a long way to assuring them that even if we can't reach agreement on cooperation, which we hope we can, uh, that this system doesn't present a threat to them. You've um, mentioned a couple of times Iran now. Could you just bring us up to date, given the meetings you've had, what you see the Iranian missile threat being, the types, how soon they could have an operational missile that could strike the United States or Europe? And is it a growing threat now? Do you see them putting more resources into it? Well, we've seen a number of missile tests. I think you've seen the, the stories in the in the press about them, uh, possibly uh, up up to and including a capability uh, that might lead to a space launch uh, vehicle, which would be, of course, capable ultimately of a, developing a further capability uh, that could reach the United States. The timing, I think, is a little bit hard to um, to pin down. I think all of us are chastened by the experience in 1998 when, you know, people thought that we were some years off before uh, North Korea would have a multi-stage uh, intercontinental capability, and they were able to demonstrate that they at least were moving in that direction a few months later. So I think it's a little hard to pin down exactly how that um, uh, how the timeline will evolve. I, I think the judgment we have is that the, the threat starts to mature in around uh, 2015, and one of the reasons we're moving ahead now is we want to have a capability in place uh, to meet that threat and that timeline that it's developing on, um, because it takes some time to put these defensive systems into place. Uh, and I think it's uh, prudent to have that uh, defensive capability in place before the threat matures. I think uh, trying to put it in place afterwards would become a lot harder uh, and would subject, uh, I think, our European friends and allies and potentially our forces to being subject to both attack and, and blackmail. Can I just ask you to clarify, when you say mature by 2015, do you mean that they could have a capability for a missile? To reach the United States by then. What about Europe? Sooner? They, well, they already range part of Europe, and, and um, you know, uh, including a place that I know well that I used to 
be the United States ambassador to, um, and uh, they'll be able to reach further afield as their capability matures. As I said, the Russians and other neighbors come into range first, and we come into range second. Tony? Just pushing back, chastened by the 1998 experience, a lot of skeptics are going to say, how much were you chastened in these assessments on Iran by the pre-war Iraq intelligence and how that was so wrong? How is the intelligence, the emerging consensus on Iran different in terms of the, how, the sol how solid the data is versus build up to the Iraq war? Well, I, you know, I would say, first of all, on the ballistic missile side, uh, with regard to the pre-war intelligence on Iraq, I mean, everybody who's been through that, I think, is chastened by the experience. And uh, we've had the Rob Silverman report and others that have pointed out some of the deficiencies that need to be corrected. And uh, we've got legislation and the intelligence community is taking action to to remedy those things. I, I would point out on the I Iraq front that the one area where the um, pre-war findings uh, turned out to be an underestimate were in the missile area. I mean, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, David Kay and, and Charlie Delfer did find, that there were plenty of uh, Iraqi missiles that violated the uh, limits that had been placed on them by the, the 16, 17 UN Security Council resolutions. Um, so you know, missiles are things you can see being you know, fired uh, from national technical means. And while I would always say I'd like, you know, like any policymaker, I'd like more and better intelligence on the subject, um, I, I think uh, we, uh, while we need to be you know, prudent about what we don't know, uh, I think there is you know, evidence here that, that this is moving forward, and you can see it in their public statements. And One quick follow-up. Does the 2015 date presuppose outside assistance, or is that the intelligence community's best estimate of indigenous Iranian production without Russian or North Korean help? Well, they, they are getting help from Russia and North Korea, as, as, you, as your question um, suggests. Um, I, don't know that it's, I don't know that that date disaggregates that. I can't really tell you that. But I mean, the point is uh, we have to be prepared whether they do it indigenously or whether they have help. So. Um, could you talk to us about the costs of this for the 10 interceptors and, and the radar and then operating it and um, the relative risk of an ICBM attack on Europe versus a terrorist attack or a, a theater missile, a shorter range missile attack, and why that money is well spent? Well, I think there's money in the budget um, f for the initial work that would be needed to um, uh, begin the process of uh, deploying the 10 interceptors uh, to Poland, I think it's somewhere in the vicinity. You'd have to check with General Obring. I think it's somewhere in the vicinity of uh, $1.7 billion, something like that, total when it all gets looked at. And then uh, there's some lesser amount of money for the uh, deployment of the X-band uh, radar. Um, <clears throat> I, I think those are relatively prudent investments. Of course, there would be operational costs over, over time. It's a little hard to quantify that in, in advance. And, and some of these numbers are going to shift as as these discussions with the host countries go on. Um, it, as opposed to other threats, uh, you know, yes, there are the threats of terrorism, and, and uh, um, uh, one has to take prudent steps to deal with those, too. But I don't think it's an either-or situation. I think we, we're confronted by an array of threats, and we need to take prudent measures to, to meet, you know, meet all of the different kinds of threats that that are out there, including the threat of nuclear terrorism that might be borne by some other vehicle as opposed to a missile. But we see the missile programs developing. The countries that are doing it are doing it for a reason. They think it provides them with some, some benefit and some ability to offset the power of the U.S. and uh, its allies, both in the region and, and, um, and in Europe and, and uh, around the world. Um, and so we have to figure out a way to deal with, with the threat that that represents. NATO to share any of the costs? Well, I think what right now we're looking at is um, how we can provide uh, some uh, benefit to protect Europe based on uh, what we have been able to develop with regard to the long-range uh, ballistic missile threat that um, faces us and also challenges Europe. Um, there is also a, a short um, and medium-range threat which will uh, not be completely covered by this effort. That, um, that NATO has to look at. NATO has its own um, uh, plan for an active layered theater defense uh, that it's been working on. Um, that work ought to go forward. And our hope is that we'll be working in parallel with our friends and allies in Europe um, and uh, with NATO so that the system that NATO ultimately moves forward to develop is compatible, uh, complementary, 
and uh, and uh, perhaps uh, ultimately interoperable with what we're proposing. So no on the, on the ICBM defense? No is the answer? Uh, you're not looking for money from NATO for this the long-range missile defense? No, this is, uh, I think, uh, something that we're looking at as um, the nations that are involved in this, and it's not just Poland and the Czech Republic. I, you know, draw your attention to the fact that we've got the radars in in Filingdales and in in um, Tula and Greenland. So we've got Denmark and the United Kingdom involved as well. In some sense, this is uh, five member countries of NATO making an initial national contribution to protecting Europe and working together with what NATO is doing um, in its uh, its uh, theater defense efforts. Sir, sir, can I get back to the Russians real quickly? <clears throat> Given the, the vehemence of, of their objections, and some would say belligerence of their objections, is there any thinking in this building about perhaps tabling this, at least temporarily, or, or, or you know, pulling back a bit on the negotiations with the Poles and, and, and the Czechs in particular? No, we're not pulling back. We're, we're moving forward. The Czech government uh, has uh, uh, approved last week moving forward. We're anticipating an answer from the government of Poland. We've got these briefings, as I said, that uh, we're going to be doing in in, um, in Brussels on the 19th of April. And um, we're also very actively engaged with Russia, as we have been. Uh, we've had, I think, uh, close to a dozen, if last time I counted, uh, interactions with Russia. We're prepared to, to do more. I've noted that since the President's phone call uh, with President Putin, um, we've had um, a bit of a cessation of the um, of the uh, incessantly negative uh, statements from Russia, um, and I, I hope that um, we'll be able to make some headway on the um, on the discussion in the discussions we're having with them on the uh, possibilities for cooperation, uh, and we'll be able to get back to a discussion of facts as opposed to uh, discussions of fears, uh, founded or unfounded. Nice follow up. Rightly or wrongly, the, the missile defense system is, is very closely associated with Secretary Rumsfeld. I'm curious whether you've discussed this with Secretary Gates and whether he is, is similarly enthusiastic about proceeding uh, along the lines that they have been in, in Europe. Um, well, S Secretary Gates uh, uh, is the one who actually made the decision uh, in December to propose to the president that we begin the process of, of uh, moving forward with Poland and the Czech Republic uh, to develop a third, third site in Europe. Um, I briefed him on it, um, and he, he made that uh, decision. Um, and I think he uh, is very supportive um, of uh, what we're doing in missile defense. Are we going to form any joint uh, working groups with Moscow? And do you have any plans to go to Moscow yourself in the near future, you or Secretary Gates? Um, I, uh, I don't want to get into the schedule of who's going where, because we're still in the process of, of uh, working out um, exactly who is going to go where when, because um, we've got a State Department component of this, as well as um, the Defense Department, and we've got the NATO event, and so we're we're in the midst of trying to schedule all these things. And uh, at, at the appropriate time, when all these things are actually scheduled, we'll we'll announce them. But uh, I expect that we will have a lot of discussion uh, w with our Russian counterparts as to working groups. Uh, that that's possible in the future. I, I don't think there's a a plan ahead of time to do that. We'll we'll see what what grows out of the discussions. If there are areas where the two sides want to delve into further, we're certainly opening, open to having working groups. I mean, we already have one in a certain sense. Uh, Ambassador Joseph had a, um, a strategic um, uh, dialogue uh, underway with uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Kislyak. Uh, last September when we met in Washington, I participated in that. Uh, when, when Ambassador Joseph went to Moscow, uh, more recently, some of my colleagues from OSD were, were there, and uh, although that's not a working group, I think in the sense that uh, you're suggesting, uh, it, it is a, a venue for ongoing discussion of this where this subject has been uh, talked about on a number of occasions. Uh, if there are some things to do more concretely, I think we're open to having uh, working groups if both sides agree it's something to be pursued. Sir. We uh, shift to the other side of the world and talk about North Korea. What kind of implications, I mean, it's early days, but what kind of implications does the potential uh, peace agreement or agreement with North Korea on its nuclear program have on U.S. missile defense plans in terms of the fact that, that, that the sites that exist now in Greeley uh, and in California are basically intended to to defend against North Korean missiles. What happens if that threat goes away as a result of this agreement going into effect? Do you, what do you do with those missile defense? If, if the threat goes away, I think all of us would be very happy. Well, um, you keep them there and then risk 
uh, 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 getting China quite upset about the idea that perhaps well, they, those sites were always intended to defend against Chinese missiles. Well, well, I have great confidence in the negotiating skills of my friend and colleague uh, Chris Hill. Um, and very hopeful that we get a positive result out of the efforts he's undertaking in the six-party talks uh, and, um, and uh, everybody in the U.S. government bending their efforts to make sure that that happens. I don't think we ought to get ahead of ourselves. We still have a missile threat that we have to deal with. If it turns out to be one that becomes more benign over time, that'll be great. But those, um, those interceptors in Greeley can also uh, be used to defend the United States against uh, a missile attack from uh, Iran. They can... Uh, uh, they can reach the east coast of the United States and even without the uh, 10 interceptors in Europe. Um, and uh, as I said, one of the concerns we have is to make sure that we keep U.S. and European defense coupled. And so I don't think we want to have a situation where only the United States is defended um, and not our friends and, and allies in, in Europe. Sir. In the past, there have been attempts to have substantive missile defense cooperation with Russia most notably the, the Ramos satellite experiment. And ultimately, those uh, things faltered when it got down to the details of liability issues and things like uh, tech sharing. So what gives you the confidence now, or what makes you think now that things could be different and you could go ahead and have some kind of, you could bring Russia into the fold and have BMD cooperation there? Well, you're certainly right. Tax and liability issues have been a, a persistent problem in a lot of areas, uh, both with regard to this kind of technology sharing, but also in the cooperative threat reduction area, et cetera. Um, I, I'm hopeful that we can overcome this because, A, we've got a common threat, and I think uh, uh, the comments Russians have made from time to time about their own anxieties about the INF Treaty reflect a, a sense that there is a threat from their south that they need to respond to. Uh, our view is that it would be better to respond to that threat by developing defenses rather than having to recreate a category of offensive weapons that they, uh, they and we uh, decided to forego, um, you know, almost 20 years ago. Um, it is 20 years ago. It's, it's in time, yeah. Time flies when you're having a good time. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we think that defenses are a better way to go. And I'm um, uh, hopeful that the latest conversation that the President and President Putin have had have, um, you know, led to maybe a little bit of a rethinking about how important uh, the possibility of cooperation is and the possibilities are real. Uh, last week, General Obering said that you have recently signed a framework technology sharing agreement with Italy regarding the missile defense system. Can you give us some details about this agreement? Well, that's really an agreement MDA has signed, and I, I, you'd really have to direct uh, the um, question to General Obering because I haven't been involved in that myself. Do you have an idea when the negotiations will start with the Czechs and, and the Poles, and who will be the chief negotiator on the U.S. side? Uh, I don't. I don't think um, that we've uh, actually got a date set yet. I mean, we only got the decision um, on uh, on Thursday, I think, from the Czech government, if I recall correctly. I was moving around Europe pretty fast, but I think it was on Thursday, um, and uh, or perhaps it was Wednesday. But in any event. Um, we, I think we'll begin having some preliminary discussions about that, but the negotiations will almost certainly be led um, by our state colleagues because they are the ones who tend to negotiate these kinds of agreements. Who precisely? I'm not sure yet. Sir, how do, they, how do we work the command and control for this system, and is that subject to negotiations? Are uh, your negotiations? Well, this is a U.S. system, and and so the command and control. Uh, will remain in the hands of, of the United States. Uh, however, we expect that there will be discussions about exactly how the system works. I mean, one of the things about missile defense is that the timelines that we're talking about here are a great deal shorter than the uh, seemingly luxurious timelines we were talking about in the Cold War when dealing with offensive weapons when we thought we had 30 minutes in order to make a response. You're now talking depending on the circumstances of a window between two and maybe 12 minutes. So uh, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of how the battle management piece of this, the execution uh, protocols of this work, are pre-programmed into the system. Uh, and some of that is obviously going to have to be uh, part of a discussion that we would have with governments that were hosting um, significant parts of, uh, of, of the system. Um, as as we go forward, but but in the end, um, you have to have the command and control piece in a position to execute very very quickly. 
did the Czech Republic or um, the government of Poland get any material inducements to cooperating? Did they get a promise of more foreign aid, or is this just a question of time closer to the United States? No, they've agreed um, to begin these negotiations without uh, promises of any kind. Um, we, um, there will be obviously certain uh, ancillary economic benefits that will flow from having these facilities uh, both constructed and then uh, present on their, on their territory. Um, and we're prepared to discuss with them other, other needs they think may emerge out of uh, hosting these things. And, and if there are things we can do to be helpful, we are very prepared to discuss that and be helpful. But there have been no promises of, of any specifics. I want to follow that question because a lot of people in Czech Republic and Poland are afraid that if this system would be located in our countries, Poland or Czech Re Republic may become a target of an attack. And a lot of politicians expect Americans to provide us with additional defense systems like Patriot or VH, AAD. Would you be ready to do it? Well, I, if there is a you know military uh, need uh, that and requirement that can be identified, I think we're prepared uh, to discuss it. Um, uh, the system itself provides certain amount of defense. If there are uh, other kinds of defenses that are, it might be necessary, um, we, um, we can sort of look at that. Um, but I think no commitments have been made. And with regard to THAAD, um, you know, it may well be that THAAD plays some role in, in NATO's uh, broader effort at, at uh, short range and theater missile defense. That is yet to be determined. But I, I think we're not in a position to start talking now about what will or won't be provided. Uh, we'll have discussions, and if there is a, a clear military requirement that can be identified, we're prepared to address those as they arise. Uh, sir, yeah, I want you to address the arms race aspect of this. Since you've uh, decided to deploy this system, Russians and the Chinese have vowed to make vast improvements to their ICBM force. How does this all make us safer if there are better and stronger and faster ICBMs out there? Well, first of all, the uh, Russians and the Chinese already have uh, modernization programs for their uh, strategic forces underway, uh, developing uh, new, new systems, new warheads. Um, so the fact of defenses possibly, 10 interceptors possibly being deployed in, in Poland, uh, which are not aimed to deal with either the, the Russian or the Chinese uh, missile uh, threat, um, I think, doesn't contribute in any way to uh, to a uh, you know burgeoning arm ra arms race. Uh, I think what this what this does do uh, is give people some assurances that as countries like Iran develop a missile capability, we can assure our allies that we uh, can and will defend them, um, and we hopefully can dissuade Iran from pursuing this avenue. And others, as I said, they're not it's not just Iran; they're 20 countries developing ballistic missile programs of one kind or another. I think we want to dissuade them from pursuing those programs, ultimately deter them from ever using those weapons if they uh, de decide to proceed with those programs. Um, and if deterrence fails, to be able to defeat them. Just a quick follow-up. You, you sure. referred to the, you didn't call it, but the Joint Warning Center issue with Russia and the, the common operational picture. Are you any closer to having that with the Russians? Well, we've, we've uh, had a number of offers that have been made. The Russians have never really pursued, I would say, any of those offers. But we're prepared to the, the advances in the technology are quite dramatic over time. I mean, the, the, um, the um, so it, it's possible that, you know, we can sit down and just go around and hopefully make some progress and uh, get them to agree. How is this system different from the Aero missile system that the U.S. helped develop with Israel? Is it different, better? Why not just use the same system that was funded? So this has, a, I think, a, a greater range and greater capability than the Arrow system. But again, for the technical programmatic side, I'd, I'd refer you to General Obering. He can give you the specifics on, on that. If um, To follow on this gentleman's question, if there's a military requirement for an anti-ballistic missile defense system now for long-range missiles that don't yet exist, why isn't there a military requirement for short-range systems, for short-range missile systems that do exist? Which short-range systems? Shorter-range systems that are proliferant throughout the world that can hit Europe currently that you told him maybe if a military need arises we would talk about providing. Well, I think we're prepared to talk about that. I don't, I don't at this stage at least, I've not seen anything that would indicate that Patriot would be necessarily the right solution for that 
problem, uh, we'd have to look at it more closely and see again if there's something that makes military sense. I mean, we're, we're happy to look at things that make sense militarily if, if, if need be. Uh, but I have not seen anything at this stage, and maybe it'll come out of the discussions with our Polish and Czech colleagues, but I don't want to presume what might or might not come out of those discussions because they haven't started. I'm having a hard time following the logic of it. If, if the logic is, is that there is a military requirement to provide defenses against missile systems that are not yet developed by Iran and other countries, right. and there are shorter-range systems that do can hold Europe right now in their, in their sights, I don't understand well, why. I there's not a military requirement. I don't think there's a, in, in, the, in the case of the Czech Republic and Poland, I don't think there's an immediate threat right now that would be met by Patriot. If we can identify one, then we'll look at that. We're certainly prepared to look at that. Good question about Russia. Uh, what's the state of uh, their assistance to Iran? We know they provide civilian, uh, civilian uh, nuclear technology, but are you assured by the Russians now that they're not, their industries are not providing Iran missile technology, either for short medium or their long-range programs? Well, as you know, there there have been in the past a number of entities in Russia that have been involved. Some of them have been in, historically in the past sanctioned. Um, I'd have to go back and look specifically at the current state of, of, of that. I haven't looked at it recently, Tony, so I can't really give you a specific answer. There's an irony here. If Russia's complaining about a system like designed to protect against Iran, but some of their industries are, have been covertly providing Iran missile technology, it, well, it, it begs for an explanation if there is one. Uh, you could replicate that um, discussion in some other areas as, as well. I mean, I agree. It's an interesting question. You ought to ask our Russian colleagues that question. Um, how, how do your discussions with Britain about U.S. missile defense assets there fit into this picture in, in Europe? Are they related at all? And if not, what are you seeking to put into the, the aisles of Great Well, her, her, her Majesty's government is already a participant, as I said, as, by virtue of hosting the uh, radar at Filingsdale's, which is being upgraded. Um, we've had some uh, discussions uh, over a period of time about uh, what other uh, contribution um, the United Kingdom might uh, might make to the system. Um, those discussions are continuing. We haven't really, I think, um, come to any conclusion or, or really uh, completely identified at this point any concrete uh, things that they might do, but, but it could develop over time uh, in that direction, but we're just not there yet. Uh. Sir, again, follow up on a colleague's question, a bit of subjective. Uh, during your trip last week, give us a sense of the sort of the political temperature in, in Poland, the Czech Republic, because obviously, as, as was stated, there's some domestic opposition growing yeah. to bo both uh, in both countries. Yeah, I, well, I was not in Poland, so I don't want to speak uh, about the situation there. My other colleagues were there, and I, I hope to get there. Ambassador Ash has asked me to come, and I hope I can get to Poland. I haven't been there in, in uh, some years. Um, I, I used to be the deputy chief of mission in, in the Czech Republic, so uh, the, and it was the first time I'd been back in 11 years, and the city still looks great. In fact, looks better than it did when I was there 11 years ago. Um, you know, I think first of all, uh, there is a bit of an absence of information, and um, and as I said uh, in the press uh, discussions I had in Europe, I think we bear some of the onus for that. I don't think we provided adequate information about what we were doing. So I think some basic facts uh, were not part of the discussion, um, in including the fact, for instance, that these interceptors have no, uh, not only have no nuclear warhead, they have no conventional explosive warhead. It's purely a kinetic kill vehicle that destroys the incoming missile by virtue of the kinetic energy released by the collision. Um, there were some other, I think, technical misconceptions that people had, and so I think it was good to be able to uh, to do that. In all of these countries, certainly in the Czech Republic, um, this, is, uh, this is a matter that is going to be subject to their uh, democratic parliamentary debate. That's, that's perfectly appropriate. Uh, one of the things I did uh, when I was there was to meet with some of the members of the parliamentary opposition uh, to discuss with them the, the basic facts of this. And I, I personally believe the facts are on our side here, and so the more uh, that is known about this, uh, the better, better off, uh, you know, uh, their debate will be, and the better off we will be. Any sense of, the, of their nervousness of the Czech government as the domestic uh, opposition grows to an extent? Or? No, I mean, I, I, on the contrary, I think uh, right after I left, the um, government made its decision to proceed with the negotiations. I, I actually participated in a televised debate, um, uh, prime time, along with the foreign minister and um, uh, some other. 
Well, my Czech was good enough I could understand it, but it's, uh, it's actually deteriorated a little bit, so I didn't speak in Czech, luckily. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, it's a vigorous discussion, and, and uh, it ought to be one. But I, I think as you get the facts out, it becomes harder uh, for people to make the arguments that, that this is destabilizing or dangerous. In fact, I think it is um, that people begin to understand that there's a virtue in having some capability to defend against this threat. Yes, sir. One or two more. Uh, one of your top officials here handling um, missile defense in Asia, uh, Richard, Mr. Richard Lawless, is leaving the Pentagon pretty in the near future. Could you comment a little bit on that? Well, if uh, if and when Richard decides to leave, we'll we'll announce that. And uh, if it did happen, it'd be a tremendous loss. He's been a great colleague, and I'm a um, big fan of Richard's. Yes, I'm wondering if this is in any ways even plausible. I'm wondering if the U.S. You know, if the goal is to bring Russia in and kind of have this new wave of cooperation, I'm wondering if the U.S. is willing to offer to Russia uh, uh, some umbrella of protection from that Central Europe GBI site for parts of Russia that Moscow's own EBM site might not be able to reach. If there's an understanding that there's a common threat emanating from the Middle East and Near East, I'm wondering if those kind of things would be part of these discussions with Russia. It, it very well could be, and I think, you know, we'll address some of that um, uh, during the uh, uh, NATO uh, North Atlantic Council meetings and uh, NATO Russia Council meetings on the 19th, and I'm sure it'll become a subject of further discussion between us and the Russians. Uh, if you know, um, if if we can help them defend themselves against this same threat, I think we're you know happy to do that. Mr. Ambassador, you've mentioned the absence of information about the, the system in Poland Czech, and Czech Republic. I hope you will forgive me the simplicity of the question, but I think that people in Poland would like to understand that. Sure. Someone within minutes will have to decide whether to use the interceptor or not. So how does it work technically? I understand that an American official on the side or somewhere in the Pentagon will decide to press the button or not. But is it a time to, to contact a Polish official or how Germans, as far as we understand, would like to see the system of a part of a NATO system. So I think it's completely unrealistic to expect that someone would like to call the Brussels or shape to, yeah. to contact all NATO allies. One of the points we've made is this is not a system that's going to have dual keys. Um, <laughs> you can't do that because of the factors that you mentioned, the lack of, of time to be for, to, after the fact, once a missile is launched. To, uh, to consult. Um, in, in fact, uh, some of our own struggle is to uh, have our own weapons relief authority uh, functional and working in a, in a circumstance of that time constraint. And we, we work pretty hard on that, and we've made some progress. Um, I think where the discussion will come will be before the fact, when the, as I said, the parameters that are programmed into, into the system are, will be discussed with host countries, so they understand exactly what uh, what kinds of considerations will come into effect uh, once a missile is launched and before the weapon is, or the interceptor is released and the, and the weapon is, is destroyed. I do think that people need to shift their mindset around a little bit, I think, because we succeeded so well in convincing uh, the Soviet Union that defenses were a bad idea, which the Soviets came into this back in the 50s and 60s having a different view. Uh, we convinced them defenses were bad. We now need to move back as a result of that, I would say. We, we ended up with an offensive mindset having to do with how one deters another country by, by uh, being able to destroy their forces, et cetera, and having a second strike capability, survivable deterrent, et cetera. In defense, you're dealing with a slightly different uh, set of considerations and concerns. If, if the concern that you had in the, in the Cold War era and when the emphasis was on offensive systems. Your concern was some might, someone might inadvertently, by using offensive weapons, start another world war that would have catastrophic consequences because of the destruction that would be wreaked on people. With defenses, it flips around. So your concern is more not that um, you fired an interceptor in error, but that you didn't fire it and lost a city uh, because of failure to intercept a weapon. So it's a different kind of mindset. It's going to require a, a little bit of a reorientation of, of um, people's understandings of, of how, how these systems work. Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it.